Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nicole Towell, Senior Director of Marketing, and welcome to day two of United, United Fresh Live and the Duda Farm Fresh Foods Virtual Celery Field Tour. Duda Farm Fresh Foods is known for celery and leads the world in research and development to naturally breed superior celery seed varieties for a difference you can taste. We have invested heavily in working alongside nature to perfect growing the sweetest, crispiest varieties available. We own 184 years of celery research, develop 1,400 celery lines a year, and have 152 proprietary celery varieties, 37 of which are patented or protected. We are continually studying and testing our celery products to ensure our customers have access to the highest quality and best tasting celery in the market. Today, we are excited to have our operations team with us to take you up close and personal to one of our celery fields in Salinas, California. We invite you to use the question and answer queue in Zoom and type or ask us the question. And at the end of the tour, we'll get to them. And now I would like to introduce Greg Lewis, Director of Western Farming Operations for Duda Farm Fresh Foods. Greg? Hi, Nicole. Good morning and thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to all who are attending. We appreciate your attendance and certainly understand these are uh, matters of first impression for all of us. For all of us, so please do allow a little bit of patience if things happen uh, in and out of this video. We're doing the best we can. Uh, I oversee the production for Duda Farm Fresh Foods on several thousand acres, from Yuma, Arizona to Mexico, Oxnard, Santa Maria, and Salinas. And as Nicole said. Uh, we do have the benefit of our operations team present today. We have Brad Stinson and we have Martin Jefferson up in Salinas. We transitioned our celery transplanting from Oxnard to Salinas around the end of February, beginning of March. And we are also harvesting in Salinas at this time. Looks like a beautiful day up in Salinas for Martin and Brad. And so we can transition over there. And Martin, good morning to you. Brad, good morning to you. Uh, Martin, looks like we've got a celery transplant crew, one or two of them behind you. Looks like it's a little bit windy. Looks like I also saw some celery transplants on the ground next to you with some uh, younger and more mature celery. So if you could, for the benefit of our group, uh, give us a little bit of a play-by-play -play of what you got going up there right now. Hi, good morning. I'm Martin Jefferson. Um, I'm the production manager for Duda Farm Fresh Foods here in California. Um, I am here in Monterey County, Salinas Valley in particular today. Uh, this is the cornerstone of Duda's vegetable production during the prime summer seasons, uh, spring and fall. Um, today I'm at a celery field. Um, in particular to Duda, uh, I am at a long stock or fresh cut celery field. Um, it's uh, all proprietary varieties here. Um, this is our a seedling tray of our P4 variety. This is a moat tray. Mowing is a preparation step to uniform the plants that we use before planting. This is another variety here. This is our P38 variety. This is an unmown tray, just so you can see the difference between the two. And also, I've brought in some examples ranging over approximately 10 weeks of growth. Um, the largest stock here is about nine and a half weeks old. These are separated by a little bit more than a week and a half of production growth. Um, all the way to the far left over there being a, uh, a plant that is pulled from a tray today. That's what we'll be going in today. Um, celery in Monterey County is in the uh, top seven crops as far as crops produced. Um, it's due to its primary crop. This is our big thing that we specialize in. Um, here at the field, um, a daily operations, we have crews putting in acreage for us roughly about six acres a day. Uh, celery is very sensitive to moisture so as you can see we already have irrigation running on this field right behind the transplanting crew that's operating. Um, the type of trays we use for transplanting this is a 456 tray. This is the uh, smallest cell tray we use. Um, 
being in Salinas and being in under such good growing conditions, it allows us to use a smaller size plug. And uh, in other regions where it's a little more difficult to produce, um, you might you might have to use a larger plug to assure survivability of the plants. But this is kind of a testament to how well we're able to produce under prime conditions in the Salinas area. Um, with, with that, I'd like to transition to our transplanters so you can actually see the mechanics of the transplanting going on. Um, so we're gonna take a walk over here and take a look. Please follow me. Brad, while you're walking over there with Martin, ask Martin, what does he look for in transplant quality? And once the plants go into the ground, have Martin walk us through what type of growing conditions and time frame does that celery have? Once the, once the transplant goes into the ground, when does the harvest crew start to come in? All of our machines that uh, we utilize are uh, mechanical transplanters. They're hydraulically driven. Um, and so they have a plate on the top called a, a carousel. And the carousel spins. Uh, plucks the plants from the tray and drops them in a corresponding hole on the carousel. If we can get a little bit closer, you might be able to see that in action. Martin, can you speak to what kind of quality you look for in a good transplant of celery versus a bad transplant? Uh, Celery needs a balance of uh, growth on the top, so your petiole growth out to your leaves, as well as a fully developed root structure like this. Um, now there, you can get too many roots. That makes them hard to pull. It's called root bound. I'm sure you've heard that for many reasons. Uh, and in that case, they won't come out of the cell and you'll actually sever the plant. Uh, Ask him how many days in the nursery it takes to look like that. Will lose their soil mass and won't retain moisture and just won't grow out good. So it's definitely an art of the nurseries to make sure that we get properly transplants that are, are ready when we're ready. And how many days would the celery need to be in the nursery before they make it to the field? On the long side for my region, uh, they may need to be in the nursery up to 80 days during when they're being initially How long does the celery take in the field to get from the point where he's transplanting to the point of but harvest? During this time of year, we're at our shortest day length in the nursery. We're just barely over 60 days, about 65 days for these transplants. So roughly two months they've been in the nursery. And then how long once these are transplanted does it take for a harvesting crew to get to the same block to cut it? About 90 days. Um, Is that, so that the same all year round? It, it, it's a rule of thumb for me, just figure five and a half to six months from sowing to harvest for any celery crop in this region. Now, will that 90 day time frame change or vary at all throughout the year? Uh, yes, it will, absolutely. During our winter months, you can have 110, 120 days in the field. Um, during the, the tail end of the Salina season, when a lot of our fall products coming off in uh, November for the Thanksgiving uh, holiday, uh, we're at 110 days maturity from transplant time to harvest. Are Plus the people the behind you sealing in the, the plant so that you get good, good so moisture what are evenly the through the transplant? You doing right now? Yeah. So back to the transplanting, we have uh, two two main portions of the workforce. So you have our people that are actually handling the plants singularly. Each plant is handled and put in that carousel I spoke of. While all the people behind are followers. So the followers are assuring quality. And anywhere there's a misplant or a plant that may be misplaced, they're going to correct that either whether it's too deep, too shallow, missing. They're going to do a manual action just to make sure that all the plants are given their best chance of survivability. All right, Brad, maybe you can send it back to Greg and I can give a couple closing comments and I can send it over to Harvest. Okay. Uh Greg, I believe that about wraps it up here. Do you have any closing comments that you would like to add? I do. Thanks, Brad and Martin. And again, certainly understand the conditions with which you're operating right now. It is always a little bit of a challenge up in Salinas. You'll note that it's not even 11 o'clock in the morning up there. And we have considerable wind, which is why we use that sprinkler pipe to establish the plants because we get that coverage with the pipe 
that we're not going to quite get with the drip tape. The drip tape will go in the field uh, several weeks after transplanting, but uh, at the outset, just to get the volume of water out there that we need, we stick with uh, the sprinkler pipe and take that through the farming season until we get tape in there. Uh, so Brad uh, and, and Martin, certainly thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we'll transition over to a different field where we have Oscar and Martin who are going to demonstrate to us what the celery is going to look like between 90 and 100 days later, depending on the variety. Hello, how are you? This is Oscar Rodriguez, and I'm here with uh, Martin Soto, the celery uh, harvest manager. And we're going to see here how, how we harvest the celery out in the field. Hi, everybody. I'm Dean Deacon Thaler. I'm vice president of Western Operations for Do the Farm Fresh Foods. And uh, as Oscar mentioned, we're going to go through the steps here that it takes to uh, go ahead and cut the celery. And when you come up to a, a crew that's in the field, they're working very fast and it's very hard to understand exactly what they're doing because they're moving so quickly. But it's a very strictly choreographed operation. As you can see, he's, Martin is slowing things down here. He's grabbing the celery, both his backhand towards his body, which allows him, once removed, to then trim the root area and eliminate spurs that are left. He measures the celery, and then as he rotates his hand over, his hand will be underneath the celery so that when he tops it, and it, you'll see him rotate that over now, and his hands are underneath, he tops it. His hands are underneath to support the stems that are attached. We call them petioles. He those are attached at, that, that, at the butt of the celery, and if he doesn't have his hands underneath it, those will remove and come off. That's a very precise operation that goes on here because the celery attachment of those stems is at that butt. If he trims that an eighth of an inch too high, those stems will just fall off. So it's a very, very meticulous and precise operation. And now, Oscar, if you would, have Martine move that to a normal speed so people can see what all is being done uh, in normal uh, regular time. It just looks so natural and so fluid the way that they do it. Uh, but again, there's a lot of thought, a lot of effort, and a lot of time that has been going into the training of this. These are very highly specialized crews, and, and that's, there's not enough credit given to that. Um, you know, because uh, a tremendous amount of yield can be lost or gained at this point, as you can imagine, if the celery is not properly cut. Okay. Well, thank you, Oscar, very much. Well, I'll move over to where you've got either uh, the boxes of celery now that have been packed. Okay. We've got two boxes of celery here. And that box that he's looking at right now, that's a two dozen box of celery. Two dozen, meaning there's 24 stalks in, in the box. But those are all sized to be very similar in size so that 24 stalks do fit into that particular box. Now that box is the same as the other box. The actual contents is different, but the box structure is the same. And this is a box of 36s or three dozens. And so you see that there's more stalks across the top. This happens to be five tiers of, uh, well, four tiers of seven with one tier at the bottom of eight. That, call, that gives you the count of 36. Dean, how do you get from a 24 count to a 36 count? Well, there again, if the celery, the celery is all going to be different sizes as it goes through the field. Now, we want to create a field if production and your team does everything right, you're going to have a high distribution of large sizes at our 24s or 30 count celery. Um, now, when he starts stripping the celery, as you see it, it's going to go from a larger size to a smaller size. 
The smaller size celery goes into a, creating a 36 or a three dozen versus a larger stalk going into a 24. So there again, if, if, if the stems and petioles have to come out due to some sort of a defect or, or something that uh, is a distraction or detraction from the stalk, then we don't want that, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, an insect damage or something of that nature or, or just a break due to wind or anything that has taken place, that, those stems have to get taken off because we don't want that getting to the consumer. So once that celery is cut, that cutter is going to do a pre-strip. The final strip will be, put, will be done by the packer who then determines which size celery that is going to go uh, into the box as, whether it's a 24, a 30 count, or a 36 count, or even a heart for that matter. So there you have it, and that's, that's about what you have there um, in terms of our harvesting operations. And um, that's a mature celery field of carton celery that's uh, in Salinas, California. Again, uh, production has done a very good job. Celery quality is high, and uh, the yield is somewhere in the uh, 1,500 cartons per acre range, and that's right where we want it. Thank you, Oscar, and thank you, Martine. We really appreciate your help today. And Nicole, I'll pass it back to you for any questions that uh, our audience might have. Yes, so there was one question so far, I think the questions are coming in. Um, and it, it goes back to the transplanting, I believe it says, does the 60 days include seeding and time in the germ chamber or room? So I would assume that's a, a transplant question. Yeah, and the short answer is yes. That 60 days is the time that the seed is dropped into the tray covered with about a quarter inch coating of what's called vermiculite and then the tray goes into the germ chamber. Not all of our nurseries utilize a germ chamber, a germ chamber and that's because our nurseries here in Southern California are fortunate enough to have such favorable weather, weather conditions that we do not necessarily need the germ chamber. However, when we are germinating seed for Martin up in Salinas, and that seed is going through the December, January, February timeframe, and the nurseries are in colder environments, we absolutely utilize the germ chamber. The germ chamber can get us first crack and first true leaf within about three to five days, and it certainly uh, improves the uniformity under those colder conditions. And then yes, as Martin stated, that 60 days is from dropping the seed to delivery to the field. In Oxnard, when we are transplanting our January and February celery, those nursery days can creep up to the 65 to 68 day timeframe. Great, so another question. Are the stalks and leaves left in the field and plowed into compost? So that's a great question. And that's something that we really, really enjoy talking about because when people see a strip celery from bigger sizes down to smaller sizes, some people have communicated to say, you know, gosh, you guys are, are, are potentially wasting a lot of celery. But the reality is it, what? Turn your camera. It is a, um, it's, it's a win-win for us because while we may not be capturing all the marketable celery from every stock of celery, depending on the size the customer wants, we can then incorporate that celery back into the field. And yes, it turns into organic matter and ultimately improves the health of the ranch for the rotational crop coming behind the celery. Um, so while it is not all used and packed in, it certainly benefits the ranch. Great. So next question, at what point do you begin the cooling process? How much time elapses between the time the celery is packed in the box until it gets cooled? And how long does it take to cool celery? 
Well, that's another great question. And from the time the celery is harvested in the field, um, it takes about two hours to uh, pack enough celery to get it to a full load standpoint. That load is then on a semi truck taken over to the cooler. The cooler then takes that celery, puts it through a vacuum tube, which takes about 20 to 25 minutes, taking that celery from the ambient temperature, uh, whatever the day happens to be, down to about 38 degrees and in about 20 to 25 minutes uh, by vacuuming out the heat and replacing it with cold water. And so it rehydrates the celery and gets it ready for its, uh, its staging in the cooler. Uh, that can, the celery then, based on orders and uh, things that are, uh, as far as shipments go, can stay in the cooler for anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of days, pretty much maximum. And, uh, and that pretty much ends the, uh, uh, the cycle. And it stays at about 38, 37 to 38 degrees in the cooler at that point. Great. So looking, that there's another question. Is there a difference between your value added celery and box celery, or do you use the same celery for both? Uh, we definitely do not use the same celery for both. For both. Um, and, and the field that Martin was planting that you saw earlier, uh, that was going to become a, a uh, processor field, uh, fresh cut for uh, value added. Those stocks have been uh, grown and developed in those varieties, as Martin indicated, we're using all proprietary varieties. And those varieties are going to become very long not what you would normally see on the grocery store shelf uh, as, you know, when you're doing your weekly shopping or something of that nature. They're grown to be very long so that we can get multiple cuts out of those stocks. And being proprietary, we're the only company that can do that. Now, what we've also done is we've bred those uh, stocks to maintain a high degree of sweetness, uh, a low degree of uh, of stringiness and also a high degree of crispiness uh, and texture for the consumer to make it everything that they'd like it to be. So it's very different. We do have specific varieties for specific uses. We have specific varieties for specific regions. And we also have specific varieties for specific times of the year um, with, within our, our arsenal of, uh, of all of our varieties. Thank you. Great. So there's one last question. Mm -hmm. How do you know when the celery is ready to be harvested? Well, again, another great question. And uh, you want the celery to optimally be able to get to what we had planned it to do. Um, the celery will, in its growth stages, uh, it'll, it'll mature quicker towards the end. If you harvest it too early, you're going to lose a lot of yield and a lot of the sweetness that is developing and the, and the components that you really are looking for in the celery. However, if you let it go too long, then you can start to develop some physiological defects that you don't want to deal with. Those happen to be pith and you also have sugars that are uh, converting to starch and you're losing the taste and the texture changes, and so on and so forth. So it's a very meticulous deal as well for Greg and his team to anticipate and to identify what the proper maturity days are when they go into the field and being planted for what time they're supposed to come out of the field and be harvested. However, that does change with weather because this is not a, we're not inside, we're not uh, predictable. And uh, so we, we have to look at each field on its own merits to harvest it when it is best for the consumer. Great. Okay, we have yeah, another. Nicole, oh, yeah, Nicole. Yeah, I'll add to that just briefly. You know, we develop our varieties to have the best taste, the best texture, and the best color. And this is a constantly evolving process for us because we are always looking for that next best variety to improve the taste, the texture, and the color. 
And so we would be foolish to say that there is exactly a 90-day window from when you transplant this celery to when we harvest it. Because not only are we constantly evolving in our flavor profile and our color profile, each region we farm presents a different set of circumstances with weather, the type of tilt of the soil. And so it's up to us and the farming to be out there the several weeks pre-harvest to determine when does that celery reach its most optimum time to be cut. So it's constantly changing. And that's what separates very, very good farming companies from your average, your average farming companies. Who's paying attention to those details the most? Great. So Greg, we have another question that has come in. Is there a reason some stocks have a darker green coloration than others? Yeah, um, that, that can be to any number of re uh, reasons. It could be the placement on the bed and the sun's exposure, number one, if it was shaded out or if it had more direct sunlight. But generally speaking, the uh, different colorations is going to become, is going to come from the stripping of the celery petioles to make it uh, that uniform uh, symmetrical stalk that we end up putting into the box. The more you strip the celery, the lighter the color will be because the photosynthesis and all doesn't get to the inner stalks. And so you have a natural progression of darker on the outside to lighter on the inside. Some stalks require a little bit more stripping uh, to remove any defects or anything else uh, that would uh, negate uh, uh, an optimum shelf life for the stalk of celery. So that would, that would be the coloration difference. Now, variety to variety, as Greg had just pointed out, you will have a color difference by variety. But in the same field, you can get a stock to stock difference uh, simply by its positioning in the field, how the sunlight hits it, and then how many uh, petioles are pulled off of that stock as it's being stripped and ready to be put into the box. All right. Thank you so much for all that information today. And the great tour. So everyone, um, we'd love to continue the conversation. Uh, if you go back into the Duda booth and then head over there, there's a chat button that um, you can click on and we can talk uh, to the sales group. So thank you very much for everyone attending and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Nicole. I think it was very...